Story of Thomas Ball and the Sheriff threatens Free Keen TV with arrest. Hello, and thank you for watching Free Keen TV. I'm Jason Rapture, and tonight's top story is one of sadness and desperation. On June 15th, at around 5.30 p.m., Thomas Ball committed suicide in front of the Cheshire County Superior Court by setting himself on fire. The next day, the Keene Sentinel printed his 15-page suicide note filled with disdain and contempt for the family courts and process. Born in 1953, Mr. Ball spent 21 years in the United States Army going back to Vietnam and more, recently serving as a medic for the New Hampshire Army National Guard, married to Karen and father of three children. Divorce proceedings began roughly 10 years ago. It was alleged that Mr. Ball had committed domestic violence against his four-year-old daughter. Melissa, after slapping her and drawing blood, Karen called Monadnock Family Services about the incident and was told that if she had not called the police, Monadnock Family Services would call them instead. Karen, not wanting to be arrested herself, called the Jaffrey Police Department and officers responded by placing Thomas Ball under arrest a decision the Jaffrey police would later call a mistake. During the trial, Karen Ball's testimony indicated that Thomas did not have a history of violence and ultimately Thomas Ball was found not gu guilty of simple assault. The court pressed for counseling at the Monadnock Family Services and would not allow unsupervised visits of the three children. The Monadnock Family Services was an institution that Thomas held responsible for the circumstances that led to him being cut off from his children and refused to engage in any counseling with them. In his suicide letter, Mr. Ball felt that the Monadnock Family Services caseworker had a vendetta against him, refusing to meet with him until he changed his attitude. Thomas Ball continued to engage the courts in various legal battles. In 2009, he lost his job and could no longer afford to make child support payments. Karen filed for a contempt of court hearing that was scheduled for June 24th of this year, demanding he be jailed until payments could be made. According to his final statement, facing jail and fed up with the family court system, Thomas Ball self-immolated. This past Friday, a memorial was held by a father's right group called the Fatherhood Coalition, and Free Keen TV was there with field reporter Mark Edge. Good morning, my fellow brothers and sisters. This morning, we gather to remember Sergeant Tom Ball. A man walks up to the main door of the Keene, New Hampshire County Courthouse, douses himself with gasoline and lights a match. And everyone wants to know why. Last month, as you may recall, Tom set himself on fire on this very spot. In fact, you can see at the bottom of the granite over there where Tom's picture lies is the marks from the gasoline which he set himself ablaze with. This is Mark Edge for Free Keen TV. I'm from the Chester County Superior Court. I'm here with Paul Bowes. Right. Paul, you're here for the memorial today for Tom Ball. So we're here to stand up against the oppression that this court provides against good non-custodial parents. Fathers uh, that go through divorces have, any, have hardly any contact with their children. And the Fatherhood Coalition was formed in 1994 in Boston. There's so much discrimination in these courts, the probate and family courts, both in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and across the country. Uh, to be blunt, good fathers like myself that go through divorces get screwed. Uh, Tom Ball just wanted to be with his children. He, they were going to put him away for, I don't know, a year or so because he was behind in his child support. But what, how they get you in the probate courts is by contempt charges. Yeah, it, it, what's very difficult is these contempt hearings is that you go, you go to the contempt hearing, the guy will argue, well, I can't pay that order. It was unreasonable. And the problem is, is often the judge that made it the child support order is also the one that is judging whether they're in contempt. And they're not, they're usually not humble, they're almost never humble enough to admit that the order was not reasonable. And mm -hmm. in fact, they think that they had solemnic wisdom when they, when they enacted the order. It all starts with money. Uh, after all the years that I've done this, that it's all about the money. They just want money. They don't want the father involved in the life. And yeah. they try to, Yep. rationalize this by trying to say that, no, we're really about the children. What, what's your goals here today? Um, well, we're going to memorialize Tom's death. He made a sacrifice for the Father's Rights Movement. Uh, coincidentally, he's the fourth guy I've known 
of in the Fatherhood Coalition that have committed suicide since 1994. To give some evidence to what Mr. Ball did, he sacrificed his life because he was fed up with what the government, meaning this building right here, was going to do to him. They were going to put him in jail again for non-payment of child support. He was unemployed. What's your name, sir? James Marks. James, what's your relationship to Tom? I knew Tom when uh, we were in the New Hampshire Guard together back in the early 2000s. Uh, Tom was a good man. He was an honorable man. He, uh, he served as a medic with me in the uh, New Hampshire Guard. We were close, and then he had told me about his situation with his family, and that's when uh, our relationship probably flourished a little more. He's clearly distraught about his relationship uh, with his kids and being, um, you know, not being able to see them and that sort of thing. That's exactly right. And, and a lot of guys are in the same boat as Tom, and, and unfortunately they don't know how to handle it because it's so frustrating and there's nothing they seem to be able to do it makes a difference. And I think that's why Tom took the ultimate choice. My goal, which uh, hopefully we're succeeding by talking to you, letting people know what goes on with the court system, what goes on for men in family court specifically, so that they can be treated more fairly, so that stuff like this doesn't happen. And, um, and so children have fathers, whether they're married or not, and so they're involved in their children's lives. I think uh, that Tom was a very honorable person. He would do anything for most people, a, a medic, in the military tends to do that, mm -hmm. and I think uh, he's to be honored today and respected for what he did. I can only guess by his last message that he could no longer take the pain inflicted by the family court process. The family courts are designed to be a battleground. How wrong is this? Tom's children's are, children are the real victims here. They will no longer have a father to talk to. The real people who need to take step up and take responsibility are the judges who fail to act in fairness, Tom's ex-wife for not telling her lawyer to back down, and the attorney who threatened Tom with jail so he could make a couple of grand in attorney's fees. Mark Edge here with uh, Dwight Doan. Dwight, uh, what, what's the organization you're with? I'm with the... Uh, uh, we're the Fatherhood Coalition out of Massachusetts. Um, we're an organization that's made up of actually men and women who are uh, dedicated to changing the laws regarding family courts. Tom's uh, final statements were just read here, and he clearly seemed bitter to, to the point of uh, you know insurrection. Um, what what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Tom was in a dark place. Um, there was a statement in there about about bombing and destroying the courthouses. I don't believe in that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it won't do any good. Two, they'll just find another building to put a court in. And three, we'll end up paying for that new building. So no matter what, we lose. What we have to do is we have to change the laws. And that's where, where the real issue lies. And I don't want to point the finger at attorneys as a whole, but they're making it, what they're doing is, is they're creating unnecessary tension between couples, all for their own profit. And uh, I've seen far too much of that. I saw that in my own case. Tell me about the uh, Fatherhood Coalition. The Fatherhood Coalition is a group of men and women. Um, we're based in Massachusetts, although we reach out to the entire country, that has a goal of educating people on the court process. We have a goal of advocating for changing the divorce and domestic violence laws so that they're more fair and equitable. You knew Tom personally? Yes, I did. I knew him through the Fatherhood Coalition. Tom helped uh, helped out with the pro se seminars. If uh, somebody's in a situation like this is interested in contacting the Fatherhood Coalition, how would they go about doing that? All they have to do is Google the Fatherhood Coalition and they will see websites for CPF which stands for the Coalition for the Preservation of Fatherhood. We have many people within the organization. We're all volunteer. Um, I want to make it very clear that if you're in a desperate situation, reach out. And if nobody listens, call again. 
This is Mark Edge at the Keene County Court, and we've been here today. We've seen uh, the memorial service. We've talked to many people. Emotions have run high. We uh, listened to uh, Tom Ball's uh, suicide letter. It was 15 pages long. It uh, clearly was wrought with emotion. A man who uh, was, was pushed to the end by the, his inability to see his children. Um, some people here have uh, considered the courts to be the problem. Some people have considered it to be the laws. Some people have considered it to be the lawyers. Clearly, this is a Byzantine system that drives many people to their wits end. Mark Edge for Free Keen TV. Before we send it to the opinion panel for discussion, one notable encounter happened right before the memorial. Take a look. On July 1st, a new order was handed down from Administrative Judge Edwin Kelly, effectively barring all electronic equipment from the leased premises of the New Hampshire Circuit Court at the District Division of the Eighth Circuit at Keene. As free Keene TV crewmen were setting up outside the Cheshire Superior Court, Sheriff Richard Foote came out and threatened arrest should the news crew enter the building. Here's the problem. Uh, It's the First Amendment, sir. That's the, that's the order. So, so you know. So that happens. It's pretty early in the morning. The threats. What's the hell of process for that? Hire a lawyer. I'm just trying to make things for you. I understand what you're saying. I mean, I'm, I'm you're, you're threatening, sir. If we go inside, take the equipment. But I mean, I, I am concerned. He's going to take your freedom, property. too. And well, what you do out here, as long as that's you're not public property, too. I, I know that I pay my taxes. <laughs> so I'm pretty clear that the First Amendment says that the, 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 that the Congress shall make no law. And I guess the, the judge has made, made a law, right? Like the judge just said something. I'm just telling you what. I got you. I got you. Telling you where I'm coming from. My but I asked you, what is the appellate process? And I'm reasonably certain there isn't one. Like the judge just says whatever the hell he says, and that there's nothing that any citizen can do about it. And like it bothers me that this is America, and I can't, as the press, go into that building because you'll throw me in jail. In our panel tonight. For tonight, we have our very own Lance Weber and Hiker Courser. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat> it's pretty, pretty disturbing video, especially that bit right there at the very end where the sheriff was outside threatening Mark Edge with arrest and the producer of this show, J.J. Schlesinger, uh, for you know their um, attempt to try to simply make a recording outside the courthouse. There was no indication that they intended to go exactly. inside. Yet he felt compelled to threaten them with arrest for uh, the prospect of them actually going inside. But then he decided to make it clear that they couldn't um, cover the walkway either. They couldn't obstruct the flow of traffic. And there was, I think there was maybe two or three people that went in and out of the courtroom or courthouse that wasn't part of the uh, vigil. It's pretty maddening. This is a fairly common theme that you find uh, around courthouses, and especially here in Cheshire County, uh, New Hampshire, where You're drunk on power, <laughs> you get uh, a notice that there's a standing order in the district courthouse that there should be no video recording in the lobby, and I know that's been subject to a frequent uh, attack. Um, what what has yet to be uh, exposed here is the. Um, the manner in which these orders were presented to the public. It's sort of the man behind the curtain that uh, magically comes up with these orders and all of a sudden they appear on the wall. There doesn't, and as Mark Edge pointed out, there's no real uh, means of appealing that order. Because uh, it's not a real order. I mean, so whoever's in some crappy mood just decides, oh, don't let them do this. Don't let these people do that. Well, it's hard to tell. It could, it could very well be a real order. Um, it's, I, I suppose what they should probably do is hire a New Hampshire lawyer to uh, appeal that issue to the Supreme Court, and I'm not sure the best way uh, to set that sort of a challenge up, but 
it is something that makes one stop and think, what are they trying to hide? Why don't they want cameras inside to record what are purportedly public proceedings? Well, you're a lawyer, Lance. You should come back to New Hampshire and <laughs> take on this don't you think? <laughs> Maybe, Maybe you should go to law school and get your own degree, Heike. <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> well, in any event, uh, let's talk about Thomas Ball for a while. This is a pretty uh, ridiculously tragic situation. It here. was. I, I was there on Friday. And, and you saw the array of flowers and other items that yeah, people it, put it was on. very nice. It was, it was emotional. I mean, seeing so many people show up for this man who was so desperate to do something about what was happening to him. I mean, his... He, he hadn't had his family in 10 years. I mean, even after fa being found not guilty of child abuse or, or um, assault, it, his family was still torn apart for 10 years. I'd be very curious to know more about the facts of that case and the I would uh, pleadings involved. Um, I don't know uh, what the situation was with respect to the contempt of court matter that he was facing, but. Um, one of the things that was mentioned in the video was that Mr. Ball had only one choice of counseling services to attend, which was Monadnock Family Services. Correct. And I believe um, Monadnock Family Services was already involved with his family in some way. Uh -huh. And if he had such a personal um, opposition to using that particular agency for any reason, this really highlights the failure of a monopoly system. Um, right. I don't believe in the Mon I don't know actually. I don't know what else they could use besides Monadnock Family Services here in the Monadnock region. Well, you think if the point is to provide counseling for somebody that there are many, many licensed counselors available to provide those services. However, if he is only ordered by the court to use one particular agency, correct, and he's got a personal issue with using that agency for whatever what does reason, he do then? whether or not it's legitimate or not, he has no right. choice. It's uh, certainly one, one failure out of many in this right. situation. Um, I think one thing that was important about this case is that Mr. Ball was acquitted of any criminal charges. And I think that's sort of how this whole mess began in the first place. Right. So basically, you know, when, when by the time he was acquitted or found not guilty, I, I don't remember the official verdict, he then had to go through supervised visits and go through Monadnock Family Services to see his children again. Well, if he was acquitted, then he wasn't. It's really a function of, of the child abuse. So why couldn't he just go back to seeing his children? It's really um, uh, it's the way these civil and criminal cases are so intertwined in family situations like this. Um, there was a divorce which had already happened or was just in the process of happening at the time that the allegations of abuse arose and so he's charged with a criminal violation, he's acquitted on those charges, yet the divorce continues on down the civil track. And when you've got civil cases riding alongside criminal cases, a lot of times uh, the person that's at the center of that matter um, is prohibited from making any statements because it will impact the disposition in the criminal case that thereby prevents them from getting a successful resolution of the civil case, or at least ties their ties their hands pretty well so that they're unable to adequately address the situation. Well, I want to talk about one other thing that happened. Um, I, I went to the vigil and the reading of Tom Ball's last words and I was I was very moved by how many people were there and just the emotion and understanding for this man. I was very moved by that. What I was not moved with is I drove by the courthouse not even two hours later all signs that we were there were completely gone. Flowers, nowhere to be found. Signs, gone. Candles, gone. That's heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. like nothing had ever happened. I understand redoing the sidewalk. That's understandable. But taking flowers away after people obviously care so much. Hopefully this case generates some changes within the system. Oh, I hope so. A rise in the number of people shot by police in New Hampshire so far this year. New Hampshire police have shot six people, killing four. Normally, only one or two people are shot by law enforcement officers in New Hampshire each year. Police attribute these shootings to the bad economy, drug trade, and loss of respect for law enforcement. Angel Bermudez Rosario was being pursued by Playstyle police for selling heroin and cocaine to undercover cops while attempting to flee in his vehicle 
He was shot at and injured. James Breton of Manchester had allegedly confessed to sexual assault, resulting in a long standoff in his home with police. He was shot and killed when an officer outside mistook the sound of Breton breaking a police surveillance mirror inside his home for him firing a gun. The other four victims suffered from mental illness. Larry Minasassin was shot and injured by Salem police while he was wielding a sword and threatening suicide. Unable to find a beanbag gun or a taser, the police, instead of retreating, shot Minasassin and injured him multiple times when he walked toward them in the street. Wayne Martin Jr. had violated the terms of his release from the state mental hospital by not taking his medication for one day. When Concord police arrived to take him to the mental hospital, he refused. Hours later, the police tried to arrest him. He resisted while wielding a hatchet and was shot dead. Hillsborough police killed Shelley Narrowin this past May after she attacked other family members and pointed a gun at the police responding to the scene. She had been hospitalized for mental illness last year. Christopher Sosinski had stopped taking one of his medications and threatened to kill his wife. Police responded to the domestic dispute and killed Mr. Sosinski when he approached the officers with a knife. During their academy training, New Hampshire police officers received 16 hours of instruction on dealing with the mentally ill, including role playing and talking to someone with a mental illness about mental health issues. All six shootings have been deemed by the state attorney general to be justified under the law. Lance and Heike, what do you guys make of this? 16 hours of training. Sounds like a lot all at once, doesn't it, Heike? It's pretty, pretty sad. I mean, 16 hours is really not enough time even to familiarize oneself with the different sorts of categories of mental illness. I don't know how that could be considered a sufficient amount of time for a police officer to train, be trained with respect to dealing with mentally ill people on and, a day-to-day -day basis. And someone wielding a gun or a hatchet? you shoot dead? Well, that's when you interject a fact like that, that's going to be considered a lot more justifiable to a lot of people when you've got someone approaching another individual with a potentially lethal weapon. Um, you know, I guess what uh, strikes me about this is you've got uh, in each one of these six cases, which I guess is off the charts for New Hampshire so far this year, yes. you've got um, Attorney General's office reviewing these to come to the conclusion after a deliberative process uh, that there is no wrongdoing and these were quote unquote justified. Oh, who, who else is looking into that? That's exactly right. Because who it's else beneficial is into that? for the government yeah. to say that their workers were justified right, right. in That's these shootings. That's something that I find uh, quite shocking that there's no sort of uh, independent review of these actions. They don't even go through the process of convening a grand jury to right. bring off people off the street to prepare, present their case to, to say, Correct. you guys are all independent citizens of New Hampshire, why don't you check out these facts and tell us what you think about it. They don't even go through the subterfuge of convenient grand jury in cases like that. So I would be interested because what I've seen from these cases is only what I read in the papers. I mean, the police reports I don't believe are public or anything with this, are they? Well, they actually uh, probably are okay. public in these cases. I mean, there is, so long as the case is closed and there's no okay. uh, pending prosecution of anyone, uh, you probably are going to be able to get police reports after the dust is settled. Um, I don't know how much I'm time you would consider. No, how I wonder how much time these officers well, took to actually try to talk this person into putting their weapon down, <clears throat> into trying to reason with them to figure out what was going on. Can we calm them down enough to take their medication or to subdue them and take them to a hospital, etc. You know, I'm wondering all, how much time they actually that took. That all makes very good sense, Heike, but that's pretty contrary to the existing paradigm, which is <clears throat> the implementation of the use of force. You've got a system that's based on the use of force, and then you've got foot soldiers, so to speak, wearing badges and carrying guns that are um, in those positions to Enforce that force. Exec <laughs> execute the orders. Yeah. And when you have individuals that pose even the slightest threat or resistance then uh, that's the game that they're all geared Off up with your to head. play. You know? So I find it to be uh, much more effective when uh, people want to engage with uh, police officers uh, to use um, 
verbal argument or uh, even calling it argument may seem a little bit too aggressive for a lot of people in today's America, but... Uh, Conversation. Uh, sure, and certainly uh, framing your issues in the form of questions is highly effective. So, um, having the Attorney General's Office serve as the uh, manner for review here is uh, seems to be a contradictory and full of conflict but we'll save that for another day okay, thank you Lance hey thank you Lance and Heike for your insight on that matter could you tell the viewers a little bit more about yourselves Heike why don't you start with this <laughs> all righty <laughs> well my name is Heike Corser. Um I live right here in Keene I think I said that last week I mm -hmm. don't remember exactly what I said <laughs> Um, so a little bit about myself, let's see here. Um, I do a lot of um, activism around town and in New Hampshire in general. And why do you do those sorts of things, Ica? Because I care. I care about what goes on and I care about what will go on if no one cares. What do you think is going to happen if you don't do anything about the problems that you see? Oh, we'll become like Massachusetts, a complete police state. <laughs> <laughs> I just spent the day in Massachusetts today. It was terrible. <laughs> and, um, I, I do a lot of different things with that. I attend court hearings, arraignments, and trials in support of my friends and even people that are not my friends that I have heard about. Um, not creating harm to other people, but they're still being dragged in by the state to these court things. Um, I do a lot of sign holding, candlelight vigils, even some protests um, about things that matter to me. I'm suspecting that this has uh, won you some detractors in the community in which you grew up. Is that true? Yes. How yes. about fans? Have you uh, <laughs> received any support from the community? I still have been getting fan mail, <laughs> believe it or not. Nice. Yes, nice. I still get fan mail. It's a little ridiculous. <laughs> well, good for you. Yeah. What about you, Lance? Well, I'm an, an attorney here. I work for the uh, Human Rights Defense Center, which is a, a nonprofit uh, located in Brattleboro, Vermont. And the Human Rights Defense Center is an organization dedicated to improving the quality and level of human rights for all individuals on earth. Uh, we've got a particular focus on prisoners. Um, really? There's a famous Dostoevsky quote uh, which goes something like this which says that the level of civilization of a society is best gauged by examining the manner of treatment that uh, their prisoners receive. Um, so when uh, you look at the United States of America and the fact that you know per capita we imprison more people than any other country on the planet uh, we've got a lot of raw material to work with. Good for you, Lance. Well, thanks, Heike. Oh. Well, <laughs> I understand we've got a little bit more time to chat. All right. So. So, sorry. <laughs> Our apologies. <laughs> One thing um, uh, people can do to learn more about uh, activism in the Keene area is go to freekeen.com. Absolutely. Thank you for watching. If you wish to contact us, please send an email to tv at freekeen.com. I'm Jason Rapture. Thank you and good night.